Cool, we're going, right? Excellent. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Philippa McIntyre, and this is our guest of honour this evening, a Afriqua, otherwise known as Adam Parker. That's what his parents call him. Welcome to this talk. We are going to spend the next hour or so having a chat about um, to Afriqua about his uh, artistic life, um, the things that are involved in being an artist, uh, a whole bunch of subjects actually, um, his philosophy, his inspirations, his process when it comes to writing music, uh, his perspectives on the music industry, current challenges, particularly uh, interesting at the moment with our COVID situation. Um, and we're also going to discuss the life of the creative practitioner. Towards the end, we'll take questions from you guys. So I think you can write in to uh, the YouTube channel in the comment section. Is that correct, Hannah? Yeah. So you can, you can ask questions, you can pose questions as we go. Um, and we'll have a question and answer section towards the end of the, of the interview. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. So uh, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Cool. I just want to acknowledge uh, a few people who have made this happen. First of all, to Amplify Berlin. Thank you very much. Amplify is a... Um, they do a bunch of things basically around mentoring and helping young artists develop and grow. Uh, and you've been involved with them in the last month and mentoring some students, which I want to ask you a question about. But let's just, I'll just continue with this. I also want to say thank you to Catalyst Berlin. Um, we're in one of the Catalyst studios. This is K3. We are really, really lucky to be here at the Funkhaus in Berlin. Um, and Amplify and Catalyst have... Uh, started a relationship which is a natural relationship which has come from the fact that we we want to support um, and mentor artists um, okay so me myself i'm a tutor at catalyst berlin um, i teach on the electronic music production program on the first year um, and i'm also a house music artist as well i've been djing for a really long time and i'm a fan of afriqua well thank you so i'm very very I'm a happy. fan of you as well Thank you. Really? Awesome. Well, I mean, we, we just got to know each other, yeah. but so far, so far so good. Yeah, okay, cool. So I have a lot of questions for you. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say, actually, is I, I should just give a little bit of background for those that don't know um, what Afriqua, like what his biography is. So you were born and raised in Virginia in the mm -hmm. United States. Um, and you currently live in Berlin and you've been here for, for a while, as have I. Uh, you have a background in classical music and you play the piano. Mm -hmm. And you uh, moved to London, um, maybe, what was that, probably about 10 years ago? Yeah, it was like, like almost, almost 11 years ago now, I guess. And well, I moved there in 2010, yeah, so it's been a while. Yeah, and you went to the Royal Academy of um, Music. Yep. Which is amazing, yeah. What did, you, what did you come out with there? Like, what did you, how long did you stay? I came out with an expulsion. Did you get expelled? Yeah. Are you for real? Yeah, I, I, I served my Wikipedia page well. I think it was better than a Bachelor's of Music wow. in retrospect. Wow. But yeah, it was a, nonetheless a very, very... It was as important as it sounds. Yeah. I can say that for sure. It was yeah. a really, really important experience for me. Yeah. And I mean, being in London as well was yeah. also a very important Yeah, experience. absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm fascinated as to what the story is there. Um, it's a conservative music con conservatory, so... Yeah, I mean, conservative is in the name. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doubly so. Yeah, okay. Uh, and you started releasing... You basically fell in love with house music while you're in London. I mean, London. Wow, the music scene. Amazing. Anyway, yeah. it's got such great roots in general, and it's just so good in terms of house music and jazz. Um, Definitely. I mean, it's just re it really is one of the musical centres on planet earth yeah for sure and uh and then you started releasing records in around 2012 yeah um and you came to my personal attention with your track jump Tenth, which oh, yeah. was probably it was one of my like top 10 tracks of what well, was 2017 or something i think i guess 2019 like, actually that killer one. thank killer you track like so amazing yeah thank you i appreciate really that. really amazing track um yeah. Okay. So first things first, uh, how has the mentorship 
been going, that you've been doing for a month. Can you tell us about that? It's been great, honestly. Um, I've had experience teaching before, but only teaching piano. Yeah. It was really interesting to have the experience of teaching electronic music production, as I'm sure you're familiar with, mm. uh, intimately familiar with. I mean, but for me, it's the, it's the first time. And I mean, I've had the exact same experience that I had teaching piano, which is that by having to impart uh, these kind of fundamental lessons to upcoming artists, you really tune in to certain fundamentals that you perhaps mm. are intimately acquainted with in your practice, but not necessarily in your thoughts, yep. you know? So I'm not really thinking about the, the basics mm. of Ableton necessarily, or the basics maybe of music production necessarily even, but it's so valuable to, to actually think about those things for the sake of mm. also such a positive uh, contribution to other people's mm. artistic practice. Teaching is amazing. Teaching is For literally sure. an we'll amazing stop. thing. Yeah. I, when I first started teaching um, a long time ago now, I, one of the senior teachers at the school that I started at in Auckland, New Zealand, turned mm -hmm. to me and said, um, one of the amazing things about teaching is what you yourself learn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's that whole that whole process of breaking things apart. And, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a it's a, one of those like cinematic teacher quotes. You yeah. Know? Like I, I learn from you guys, but it is. But <laughs> it is it's, actually, it's totally true, actually. It's actually for real. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's been a cool way to start the year for sure. Just uh, kind of getting in touch with really my fundamentals and the fundamentals of how I think about music, the fundamentals of how I approach music, uh, yeah. and the fundamentals ultimately of how I create it when I actually get into a studio situation. So, yeah, yeah. it's been really nice and yeah, very cool. re-energizing. Cool. Both of the artists are dope as well. Yeah, can you tell us about the artists? So, Mink, <laughs> uh, well, that's his artist name. His real name is Spencer. Yeah. He's an artist from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. Yeah, and his uh, background was sort of in the kind of more dancey space. Uh, and, I, you know, I think... He, he really attracted me on his application with his, with his confidence, actually. There was a certain confidence in the ideas, which I thought was just something fun to work with, you know? Mm. Uh, so you got to choose who you, who you wanted to work with. For yeah, which that that's in itself cool. was a trip, that's I have a to good, say. That's yeah. onto it. Yeah. That was an absolute trip. Because, I mean, not only is it super humbling that anybody would want to work yeah. with me, yeah. uh, but it's just so interesting to get a sense into... You know, it's, it's a privilege to really get a sense of how upcoming artists are thinking about their art. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's like a trip yeah. and maybe too much of an ego trip, honestly, to see how they think about my art. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's very, <coughs> that, was, that was a very cool part of the process. So Mink? Yeah, so Mink had more of a kind of dance music focus, but really a desire to branch out into some more experimental territory and I think also to solidify his studio practice a bit. Mm -hmm. He had more experience kind of on the DJ end, not so much on the production end, but I heard something in the productions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we've been working together for the month. And so he's house music-ish. Ish. Yeah. I think there's a lot there. I, ultimately, the track that yeah. we finished is more of a dance floor focused thing. But I know that his interests are very broad. I mean, That's great. from experimental music to, yeah. you know, to modern hip hop and R&B to... Mm house and dance music so i think that's also something we really connected on yep also my dad's from louisiana so right to like show love you know uh give back but yeah the other artist lisa um she releases as <laughs> isa holo and she was really interesting because i felt like she had a very big funnel i mean i and i really appreciate that like the the amount of inspiration she's bringing into her music mm. and the amount of different styles that she's comfortable with is really interesting and almost genre defying in a way mm. and okay. her shit sounds really good actually cool. so cool. I, I was really impressed by that yeah um and i think you know with her we've been focused more on solidifying ideas a bit more so it's actually kind of the opposite yeah, okay. I actually think they had a really nice contrast because she probably needed to progress more in the solidifying of ideas, mm -hmm. uh, but her, her technical capacity and her familiarity with the software and production and stuff and just her, the quality of her work was to this point good. was already quite yeah. good. What was her name again? Uh, Lisa is her real name and yeah. Isa Holo. 
I S A H O L O. Okay. It's cool. her artist name. Yeah. Awesome. So it was kind of interesting, like two different tracks of both of them, and kind mm. of uh, contrasting personalities in a way. Mm. But the funny thing is, they actually had like mutual friends and stuff. So it was like kind of a fun. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun. The most social thing, probably. So they live in Berlin. Of. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens with the tracks? Like, what does Amplify do with the tracks after the month? I'm embarrassed to say I don't really know. I, I'm, I'm just I kind of like, like there doing... there needs to be something, right? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely something. There needs to be something. I, yeah. I should read more emails, honestly. But yeah, I'm... Hey, something good. Hey, I'm not something so good, good at coming. the emails either. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let's move into talking about you um, and just getting your perspective on things, really. Um, so... The first section we're going to look at is kind of the philosophical underpinning of what it is you do and why you mm -hmm. do it, um, which I'm just really interested in, actually. So, I mean, this is just a really big question. It might be too big, <laughs> but what are your inspirations? What are my inspirations? Yeah. And then have they changed over time? Hmm. It's, it's quite a big question, sorry. No, it's okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm a pretty broad thinker, generally, but... Musically, you know, my inspiration is pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's music. Like, my, mm. the reason I make music is because of the music that I heard. Yeah. So the music I grew up with yeah. inspired me to start playing music. Or not inspired, <laughs> inspired me at five, you know. Yeah. Inspired uh, my family to start me in music and yeah. my appreciation for the music that I was hearing. Yeah, okay. Inspired them to kind of put me on that track. And then it really is just... You know, I feel like with all of the sort of broad philosophical ideas that I have about life and that we all have, I feel like within an artistic context, it's all just boils down to just the craft, you know, on, on some level. And all of the complexity of my musical inspiration is in the music that I love and, you know, in the process that I practice to improve my music and to create more music and to create better music and to continue doing so. So I, I think that really the musical practice is my yeah. inspiration. It's how I keep myself inspired. And yeah. it's, uh, I think, really what's inspired me from the jump. Because, I mean, honestly, when you're a kid and you're starting out, like, you don't have inspiration. Yeah. Like, and uh, not like, I wasn't going to, like, give you an interview when I was 12, you know Yeah. I mean? So but that was one of my questions here, yeah. was actually, it's like the third question down in this section was, have you always been into music, and have you always known that you'd end up in music? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, definitely. Me, t me too. <laughs> nice. Me too. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a lucky, it's really a blessing, I mean, to, to have a sense of what your purpose is from an early age. Honestly, and I, I realize that with more appreciation as I get older and as I meet more people, uh, because I've never really had that search, you know. Mm. I was never really questioning. I had some small, I entertained in a, I, you know, I went through mm. like my childhood, mm. like uh, job fantasies, you know, of mm. like wanting to be like a firefighter for like a week or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I've basically, <laughs> I've basically always been, been um, focused on music and always been convinced that it's what I would be doing. So was it in your family? Not in a career way, but in a in an appreciation way, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's better. Yeah, the love of music of often gets passed down, doesn't it? Well, I think it the love of music maybe is a l lower pressure and healthier motivation uh, to instill, you know, maybe a career ambition in your kids than like you're mm. having a career in music, if mm. that makes sense. Completely, yeah. So I never felt, uh, you know, there's some disadvantages as well. I think that, let's say my parents were classical musicians. Mm. Then starting their child and piano lessons, surely they would have had some better framework of, let's say, what's required. And, you know, in some sort of hindsight 2020 kind of way, uh, you know, maybe they would have like pushed me a bit more or something like that. But even then, you you don't know what the um, what the downsides of that could be as well. It could also mm. be that you get a little bit more pressure. You get some mm. negative associations at an early age, yeah. and then you're yeah. you're short circuited, you know, and yeah, your yeah. your affection for the for the art is short circuited. So yeah, yeah, my family is like perfectly musical for me because they introduced me to 
great fucking records. Yeah. Without any fanfare and without any pressure. Yeah. It was just there and it was playing because they wanted to hear it. Yeah. So what sort of what sort of style of music was often in your home when you were a kid? It's funny just to, out of interest. Today I just had this crazy moment where I realized I know like every Earth, Wind and Fire song, <laughs> yeah. for example, <laughs> and then I, I thought about like, uh, so that definitely won, you know, like it's the sort of band that sort of fell out of my circulation, probably because I heard it so much when I was a kid. Yeah. But yeah, we listened to like uh, a lot of Earth, Wind and Fire and like Barry White yeah. and Al Jarreau Love and Barry you know, yeah. just, but not just that, I mean, I can say that like when I was growing up, and I, this is another thing I didn't realize until I got older and sort of experienced more of the world. But I grew up on, first of all, I grew up uh, in the 90s when the music market was still more segregated a bit. Mm. Now, you know, hip hop is the most popular music mm. in the world everywhere. Uh, but, you know, I think in the 90s still, and I distinctly remember this when I was a kid, but didn't realize it at the time, but like it was still very much, you know, kind of white pop radio mm. and, and urban then, radio yeah. is what it would have been called uh, mm. by like uh, sweaty executives. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I really grew up on urban radio, you know, so I, mm. I it was, you know, Erica Badu was just on the radio. It was mm. top 40 sort of uh, music in that context. and. The Roots and D'Angelo yeah, and all of amazing. these artists in their sort of uh, in the early stages of their career were really like the it was just in rotation kind of daily music yep. uh, in that context. So I'm very thankful for for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And certainly in New Zealand, we had to search that out, which I did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Big ups. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that's even that probably makes it even more more enjoyable on some level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is, a, this is a bit of a deeper question, but maybe it would be better for later. We might need to return to this one. So it's, it's just, what is it that you're trying to say with your music? Hmm. It's, a, it's actually quite a, it's quite a deep question. It's the sort of thing that I ask my students. Yeah. Well, and what is it you, that you're trying to say? And it actually it takes, can, take a bit of, can take a bit of thinking about that one. Are you encouraging me to think a bit about it? Or well, I, if you want to go for it, you go for it. Um, well, I mean, thinking of, you know, considering my answer to the first question, I think it really applies to this one as well. You know, what I'm trying to say in my work, you know, I, I'm not really trying to say something as much mm. as I'm doing the work. Yeah, okay. You know, I think if you, no matter who you are, uh, and no matter what your background is, or no matter what your story is, or what your ideas are, I think that if you get to the point, for whatever reason, that you're making as much music as I make, uh, you're saying whatever is true about yourself. Mm. You might be saying that you're super opportunistic and corny as fuck huh? as well. You know what mm. I mean? <laughs> yeah. so, like, there's a lot of things you could be saying. You mm. could be saying like, "Oh, I'm trying to make a lot of money." Mm. and dip out of this into some other industry by the time I'm, you know, 24. Like, you could be saying that, too. Mm. But for me, the focus is, uh, it's just the, the practice. You know, if I'm, if I'm in the studio making music, then that's, that's the speech. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And then the, ultimately what I'm saying, it's not, so, it's not so much that I'm going into the process uh, with a, a plan, so to speak, the only plan is to kind of say something, you know, and I think that's more my focus. Like, how do I say as much uh, as I can in the most effective way? So you're articulating a vibe. Yeah, and also just articulating my vibe, you know, yeah. uh, because if I if I put if I don't make it optional that I'm going to be expressing something, mm. then I just have the feeling that whatever I'm expressing is kind of the right thing. So it's not like some automatic writing shit, you know, <laughs> just, uh, it's not like that far, but it is, uh, you know, it's a bit more of a ritual kind of. Trusting of the process and trusting of exactly. the, trust, trusting the soup is a great um, Stephen Pressfield quote. Trust, trusting the soup. Trust the soup. 
I don't know what that means, but I... So I basically, you, all of the things that, like, when you're in the process, when you're writing music, all yeah. of these inspirations and the things that are in, informing how you're feeling and what's going on with you mentally and what you've been reading in the newspaper or whatever, all of these things, mm -hmm. they're just kind of, they're going to come out. But Absolutely. you're not necessarily, like, tracking it rationally um, and consciously can be quite difficult. You just kind of need to throw yourself into the moment and go with it. And if you try and control and tame it, you can actually end up fighting yourself and ruining the vibe. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of music that has something explicit to say. And I think even that, if it's good, is kind of more of a trust the soup situation. You know, I don't imagine... If it's authentic. Yeah, I don't imagine like Marvin Gaye going to the execs and being like, guys, I have something to say and it's what's going on. And, you know, I have a feeling it was more sort of like, He's writing, mm. he's expressing, <clears throat> yeah. the body of work comes together. And yeah. then it's a conversation of like, hey, this is different than something I've made before and we need to uh, figure out how we're going to put this out. Particularly when it's soul-based music, because then it's an expression. So he's letting out, his, you know, he's expressing his soul, he's expressing his pain, his hurt. Yeah, but I mean, all great music is soul Based music. See, I would it's agree. It's not necessarily soul but music, but like. Not everyone you know, agrees though. But Bach was like super into Lutheranism and whatever, you know, so that was his, uh, that was his soul music for sure. And he, yeah. he's got like the best catalog. Yeah, I love Bach. I mean, uh, yeah. there's no better sort of, uh, yeah. if there was publishing at that time, the Bach family would be minted, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, and it's the same thing. It, yeah. He, it, I don't think that it was so much, you know, I think you have to be sort of humble in the face of the process, you know. Maybe I would take it even further than trust the soup. Like, you have to kind of humble yourself before the musical process, in my opinion. Mm. It's not really for you to decide mm. what... Completely agree. Yeah, that's kind of my, yeah. my general vibe. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about process. We get it. We're going to come back to some some of this stuff, though, for sure. Um, let's talk about process. So what um, what is your process for writing a track? Like, how do you begin? What do you begin with? It's changed. I think I, it really goes in phases where I'll do maybe the same thing on almost every track for an extended period of time. Like a few years. Maybe maybe like six months to a okay. year I might go through a time where I'm thinking for instance right now I'm obsessed with sampling you yeah know? me too and it's the first time really I've ever been so into sampling mm. it's always played a part in my practice but then I finally kind of hit the bug of like that mad lib kind of just mm. looking for the perfect loop almost like I'm mm. DJing you know mm. to make my drums yeah okay um, interesting and, but that's just right now, you know, and then yeah. eventually there will be a moment where I'm, I feel like I'm being derivative of myself, you know, uh, and then I'll change that shit up, you know, <laughs> so it's just a, it's kind of um, like I'll hit a, sort of hit, hit a new bug on some sort of process and then I exhaust it for a minute. And then it'll always, like that, you know, now whatever practice I'm doing on sampling, I think whenever I might even want to sample a little bit, either on my own shit or if I'm working with someone else, all of it will be informed by the work I've done with samples in this kind of, like, intensive, you know? Yeah. But... So it's exploring a new area. Exactly. Yeah. But, like, kind of deep exploration of a new area yeah. per time. Uh, but another way I'm kind of starting to work lately is, and this is always factored in, but I can see this being a much bigger part, maybe the next sort of intensive chapter. Right. Is just writing a song on the keys. Yeah. Like not sort of... Right. Yeah, I wondered if you did that because you just, you love your keys. It's just so much better, honestly. Like, mm. I mean, I have to do that at some point anyways, and it's just, a, I always do that anyways, but it's a question of if I'm going to start that way. Yeah. Or if I'm going to, let's say, do the drums and maybe a little bit of atmosphere before I start writing. Or uh, find a sample. And yeah, then exactly. that, so that's what I do is I find a sample and it kind of everything springs from there. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's almost a little bit lazy in some ways because you kind of, I'm leaning on the sample. It's only lazy if you don't end up doing the work. I yeah. mean, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And also sometimes it's like, a, 
sometimes you just find a loop that is a track. I mean, that's the genius of some of the best hip-hop producers. Yeah. Uh, like, especially Dilla and Mad Lib and stuff. I mean, there's so many tracks which are just literally <clears throat> eight bars of a soul record. Completely. Repeated, you Completely. know? So Completely. You also have to be kind of in a position to, like, act on that when it's the case. Um, I'm, but... I'm, I'm just... Oh, sorry. I'm interrupting, sorry. I'm, I know, I'm... I'm well, I'm just... Th I keep thinking. So I'm really interested that you to hear you say this, actually, about mm -hmm. samples, because I... because Just because of my current um, obsession with samples as well. What are your... What is your opinion on the legal ramifications, the copyright issues? Uh, it makes sense because people should get paid for their work. Mm. It doesn't make sense because a whole genre or multiple genres of music are based on it. It's like house music. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> but sort of. The, to me, the, um, the solution is a fixed process, like within each sort of rights organization context, like, you know, okay, I sampled you this much, or I sampled this much of your track, so you automatically get this much of the publishing. You know, just something more straightforward. The problem mm. is actually that you have to negotiate it for every sample with every rights holder and stuff. The bureaucracy of it. Are you doing that? Let's say yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that's a ridiculous <laughs> question to be asking you in this forum. I apologize. No, it's, it's okay. Um, I mean, but honestly, like a lot of people, if you get sued for something, you're making money. So congratulations. Like, I mean, if you, yeah, honestly, like uh, exactly, they're not going to sue you unless you're making money. Yeah, and I mean, if they sue mm. you, let's say you. Like, if you're putting real numbers on the board to the point where some random publishing company wants to pursue some payment on behalf of an estate which they manage or um, uh, on behalf of a catalog which they've bought, you're, you're, doing, you're doing well. You know what I mean? So, yeah. like, I, I think in general it, it shouldn't really... Um, I think it's good that most people operate as if it's not a factor. Mm. That's my general thought. That's my general <laughs> thought as well, but it's well dodgy. Okay, so... Um, you can live with a little risk, you know? Yeah, okay. So what are your favorite pieces of gear at the moment? Um, best piece of gear in the world of all time, any era. You have a favorite. You Mac. really do. Oh, and a Mac computer. Yeah. That's so <laughs> funny that you say that. It's, it's um, so overlooked by people, eh? Wow. It's insane. It's crazy. Like it the idea crazy. that some random <laughs> computer from Japan in the 80s produces the best kick drum mm. of all time uh, on some sort of scientific level. Mm. Mm. Better than your, like, your Silicon Valley. Like, you can, you can talk on WhatsApp, watch a video, and run a full music production studio mm. on your Mac. Like, mm. it can make a better kick drum mm. than... Like, uh, you know, now, uh, in terms of gear that I like playing with, I, there's also gear that I like playing with, but I just, mm. in general, mm. gear <laughs> is like, mm. it's not tracks, you know what I mean? Like, it's just gear. So, I mean, I, yeah. I always, I frequently have friends who bought gear thinking that it was tracks, you know what I mean? Like, the people who buy gear and they think that they made tracks until they realize they don't have anything to play anyone. Um, but don't have anything to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe it's that, although I don't want to diss my friends and yeah. I don't want them to stop giving me their shit. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I have a lot of friends who have, like, let's say, bought a synth and then they just aren't really using it. It ends up at my crib for a year or something. Synths can and be intimidating, though, when you first get them. You know, like, I, there's the standoff period. I, for me, mm. if I buy a synth, I have a standoff period where I kind of... I don't know how to use it and so I kind of avoid it for a while. It takes me, it takes me a while to get to know a synthesizer. I appreciate that. I mean, I think I'm kind of, I feel, my feelings are a little bit different. You know, I, I kind of think if you actually have a clear sense of the components of a synthesizer, which I'm sure you do, then they're all the exact same. They sound different, but they're exactly the same. You know what I mean? Like every synth is going to have the same waveforms, same basic. I don't remember the last time I encountered a synthesizer that had some sort of uh, technical process that was radically, you know, a radical departure from mm. anything that I've encountered. Just with accumulated experience, you know, as well, mm. uh, there are some things like FM synthesis or uh, 
some different types of modular synthesis which are more obscure. And I think that it's good to familiarize yourself with them so you, I guess, know which is appropriate for a given context. Mm. But I honestly think once you understand like the basic fundamentals of synthesis and you incorporate it into your broader musical philosophy in a way that functions, I, I think I could make all my shit, I honestly think, on like a nice pair of headphones in a computer with no keyboard. Honestly. Mm. If I, I wouldn't want to. Uh, and I love sort of working in mm. dope studios like this one. I love uh, fucking around with new technology. But it's not... It doesn't, like, make you you. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, ultimately, you're just... You, you, they're just vehicles kind yeah. of for you to be yourself, so. Yeah. Um, but that said, favorite gear? No. <laughs> but I, have a, I do have a profit at my crib, which I like a lot. And, yeah, you've um, got the REV, you've got the REV too. Yes. Yeah, that's really fun. I, I have one as well. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Friend just left it. That's quite a, <laughs> that's quite a big beast of a synthesizer. Like, I, I really struggled with it at first. It's pretty, yeah, I mean. It was my first synthesizer, though. Fair enough. So I was yeah. like, <laughs> I struggle more with the question of whether or not I want to turn it on and like, like sometimes I'm just kind of thinking, well, if there's a quicker way for me to come up with something that I'm satisfied with, mm. why do I need to turn this on? It's all about the, mu it's about the music writing process as well, right? So for uh, like, like, is it like this for you? So for me, I, um, when I start writing a track, it's a, it's a bit of a race. It's a race to get it done. Like, I, oh, like if I don't, if the track's not basically done in terms of its arrangement and what's going to happen musically and the vibe and like things coming together within a couple of days, mm -hmm. then it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So I don't want to get too involved in choosing particular sounds because it's just going to really slow me down. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are pros and cons to um, to different different approaches, but that's that's kind of how I do it. So then. So then I would get involved with a synthesizer after I've written certain parts and then the MIDI starts to, I use the MIDI to control the synthesizer. That's smart actually. So That's you're how kind I do of it. writing, you're it's a, sort it's of writing the song before you design the sounds in a way. So you kind yeah. of know, okay, this part is what it's going to be, but maybe I can yeah. explore a few different patches, you know. Yeah. Because cool. if I get stuck exploring patches, then you lose, you can lose it. Like it gets, like the more, it's to do with psychoacoustics, right? So I talk to students about this all the time. When mm -hmm. you hear something over and over and over and over and over, your brain will start to, to hear it in weird ways. Like you'll morph what you're hearing into something that it's kind of not. You stop hearing what is actually in, in front of you. Yeah, but it's a sort of, it's one of those interesting and beautiful paradoxes of creativity that there's also that obsessive side on the other hand, which mm. I'm sure my girlfriend would attest to, uh, <laughs> from hearing the same shit over and over and over again mm. with no noticeable difference for like a whole day. Oh, completely. Um, you yeah. Know, which is also part of it. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I do agree with what you're saying. And I certainly feel the same way with my own work that the, the substance of what the track is needs to be done quickly. This yeah. is also something I've been trying to really instill in my mentees with the Amplify thing. Yeah. Um, you know, there, for instance, one of, my, one of the students, like, uh, has a lot of kind of material, but there's, as I'm sure you often encounter, there's this sort of insecurity, especially amongst people who do have some talent and ability of, okay, well, it could be, it's not you know, oh, it hasn't, you know, mm. <laughs> and my my main point is always, hey, this is done. Like, this is nothing you can add to this. Mm. It's going to uh, make this yeah. a different yeah. experience. Like, yeah. yeah. Your best bet is to make something else, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I think on that tip, it's, it is really important to just be quite disciplined about the process of music making in the sense of always realizing what the end game is, which is music. Yeah. Like music that's made, and then it's a question, another question if you want to share it with people, you know. Yeah. But I do think that that, uh, even just psychologically, it's really important to just kind of actually finish it. That's a really important part of my yeah. process. Yeah, it's quite hard to tell, though, often, to, like, wh like knowing when something is finished and when to walk away from it. Yeah. Tomorrow. It's finished tomorrow. I mean, if you just make sort of a, like um, some 
Yeah, it's a it's a discipline thing to yeah. be honest because it's not you. I think that if you want to kind of do this professionally, you have to change the way your brain works. Like you can't be thinking like a fan, or you can't. You just can't make it. Like you won't be able to sustain. You can't actually. Um, I don't think you can weather the process of continually creating music and releasing music, especially if you're expecting an emotional response from your own music that you'll never get. And that's often what I find happening, not only with the, the, in this mentor situation, but just with friends, with a lot of people who are trying to make music and stuff. And of course, it's a very common uh, trope, like the tortured artist or whatever. Um, it's a concept that's like way less sexy in real life, honestly. It's just, <laughs> um, crea it's just creativity and facing creativity is, it's terrifying, it's scary, it's confronting. Yeah, and, and you have to like figure out how to become kind of like a callous yeah. person. I mean, yeah. not on yeah. some level, you have yeah. to actually, yeah. and not in, a, not in a negative way, it's actually I think one of the most sort of uh, satisfying parts of developing as an artist, but you do have to be able to kind of weather things emotionally that, or may, maybe it's weathering things with less emotion than other people might be able to, uh, if you want to kind of get ahead. Because it is like a, it's a, a huge sort of process <clears throat> to be, if you think about it, like if you're making a track every day, you're reinventing yourself every day. I mean, you're mm. finishing mm. a piece of music mm. that is kind of like in that moment in the process, you're trying to make this perfect representation of who you are, what mm. you're trying to say. Which is know. why it's scary. Yeah. It's terrifying. Do you, are you writing a track a day? At my best, yeah. Holy <laughs> crap. That's amazing. <laughs> but like, well done. That's like, it's my ideal, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's not my like, I would be lying if I said that was my standard. But yeah, I mean, from year to year, on average, I'm probably writing like 90 to 100 tracks a year. That's sort of like my running. I would shake average. your hand, but obviously, no, COVID. We can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really, I'm impressed by that. I'm actually, I find that, I think that's quite inspiring. I just wrote two tracks and finished them in two weeks, and I thought that was good going. Um, <clears throat> just multiply it by 50, you know what I'm saying? I, so, just in reflection, so I kept thinking while you were talking about this, it's, it's, a li it's like when you, are, when you first start producing, right, this is quite common for young producers mm -hmm. to just really spend so much time on one track. I think I, when I began, I think I worked on a track for about six months. Yeah. It's just, it's completely unnecessary. If you're trying to make something work, like, and it's not working after six months, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Yeah. And so that, or the drums like, suck. So realizing, <laughs> exactly, or it just sucks. <laughs> yeah, or like, just. <laughs> Move, or all of it, yeah. Just move on yeah. and write something else. Yeah, it's much more valuable. Yeah. Fortunately, I think that's always come... I remember even when I was a kid, weirdly, I just never had this attachment to... I just, I've always had a certain detachment, and I realize it's a kind of... A, it's a part of my personality, uh, which just happens to be advantageous. Uh, it also has to be corrected for in other areas of life, like maintaining healthy relationships and you know, so being nice kind people. Kind of a, a <laughs> you're talking about a sort of an emotional detachment. Yeah, like not, but it's not to say that I'm mm. emotionally detached from the process, because I mean, I'm, I'm so into it when I'm working and when I'm creating, but there's also just a part of me where like once I get my fix of that creativity and that more sort of like white hot burning creativity, inspiration, mm. getting it out kind of part, mm. Then I'm just ready to sort of like, I, I want it to be done. Right. Because I also don't, my confidence doesn't really waver at that point. Mm. And I think, yeah. And I do think that that's partly probably experience. I mean, it's partly luck that I started when I did, because I started making music before puberty, honestly. Like, uh, right. I've started before kind of. I think in a normal situation, and I mean, in mine, mine included, your insecurities really start to blossom. Mm. So, like, I didn't ever, I don't know, my musical practice and the, the approach that I have to music, it still feels the same as when I was, like, 12 or 13 or something, which is just 
yeah, I just really like making tracks. Yeah. And I want to make tracks. I don't want to make sort of ideas. Yeah. I don't want to make, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make sounds. I'm not trying to collect shit. I'm trying to, you know, I want to put numbers up in terms of my creativity. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that can be practice, though. I don't think it's like, I don't think it, it requires, you know, my exact circumstances. I, but I think that the only way it can be practiced is to go against your instincts. You know what I mean? Like, that's the only... How else can you get better at something? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. It's not very romantic, is it? I mean, this is the thing, though, about creativity. It really is a muscle. You can grow the muscle. You Definitely. You get better at it. It's, yeah. It really... I used to think that music writing was magic. And I, like, don't get me wrong. Like, music writing is magic. But it's not this, like, thing that only a few people in the world can do. It is, it is a learned skill. Uh, well, I think it... If you have an aptitude for it. <laughs> okay, who, who do you think magic is the least entertaining for? Magicians. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, they're, they're literally disillusioned. You know, like, they are disillusioned by the greatest delusions. There's no sort of... Uh, <clears throat> but that's why they can do magic. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They can do magic because they've... What for us is magic mm. uh, comes from them having had the discipline to do something with such extraordinary repetition. Do the work. And, exactly. You can't get away from the work. That's, that's you, you all it is. You just can't get away from the work. But doing the work <clears throat> is the hard part, actually. Both in terms of this poetic yep. kind and sometimes of struggle it's boring. of art. Yeah, and sometimes it's extremely discouraging. Mm. And sometimes, you know, you go to try to write something and it basically just fucks you up and how bad it is, you know what I mean? <laughs> like sometimes you go, you try to write, you think that you have no talent remaining, no ideas left, and ultimately, the next day, if you can muster up the courage to face yourself again, you can make the best track of your career. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've had that happen well, before, see. you know? Yeah. And I, I think that that's honestly like where the, you know, so if magic isn't magic, in that way, then music is magic in that way, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah there is magic. <laughs> yeah, there absolutely there's definitely is magic, magic, but it's, it's, not very, uh, it's not very beautiful behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, I, I think, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering actually about this question then. How do you keep yourself inspired? Um, How do you like? Yeah, do you are there particular things like do you go to bed at eight o'clock every night? No, that would be do you eat super weird. lots like, of chocolate or like what is it? Like, like Hannibal Lecter, kind <laughs> of like uh, yeah. <laughs> um, everything is pristine in the house. Yeah, no, uh, it's not like nothing too crazy. I mean, I'm pretty crazy about my like my mornings. Mm, I have a very repetitive morning routine also to just exercise the same muscle of just doing yeah doing the shit i'm trying to do you know habit yeah exactly uh so every morning i wake up at a variety of times between 7 and 10 30 <laughs> um, yeah so pretty wide range um and i you know i uh write in my journal um i exercise yeah and meditate yeah every morning yeah you've uh, got to look after yourself right yeah so that's yeah. kind of on like a lifestyle level and then you know i have a lot of i'm just broadly interested in art um mm. with no sort of um claimed expertise in any other medium than mine but i'm a huge fan of you know i, I read a lot i love literature mm. i love mm. film i love you yeah. know experiencing other creators from mm. different eras especially mm. and you know just kind of vibing on that energy and I, i'm not sure i've never mm. really done that for the sake of inspiration uh, but it feeds the fire exactly yeah uh yeah so i think i think those things and also i just started doing a puzzle jigsaw puzzle oh my god are you for real i am so fucking <laughs> obsessed with this puzzle <laughs> I'm waking up every like, uh, that is I'm doing so like funny. four hours of puzzling every yeah, day. That's pretty cute. Yeah, so that's 
I'm, <clears throat> I'm on one with the puzzle. Yeah. Cool. So just puzzles. I mean, there are some cool puzzles <laughs> out there. My sister's into puzzles. Yeah. I never thought I was going to be, like, I've, it's, it's crazy. I didn't think I was. It's COVID that though, dude. Eh? It's probably COVID. I think this is permanent. I have had, I've definitely had thoughts of like, I'm just turning into like this little old lady rattling around my apartment. <laughs> do, <laughs> do like, do, I mean, I'm not doing puzzling, but yeah, some of my, um, just it's because the world has got so much smaller. It's, it, it is the life of, it's a little bit like knowing what you're going to be like when you're retired, maybe. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I, I, I like myself when I'm retired. Yeah, I think I've always that's, acted retired. That's good. A little bit. That's good. Also, Excellent. I just I just thought of one other inspiration that probably does inspire me a bit mm. uh, more than I thought when I was starting to answer. But I'm actually quite inspired by business and economics as well. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm like very interested in finance and finance news and just the general way that people move in the world. Uh, measured by economic data and analysis, you know. And I, it really inspires the way that I approach the music business, which really inspires the way that I approach music. So mm. I, is, it a, is, it an, is it a numbers or is it like a social data type thing? It's kind of, kind of both, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I just not so, social data as like a, as an inspiration. I mean, that's, that's a stretch. <laughs> but, but well, definitely I mean, like the, the of, social elements of it. So yeah, just yeah. kind of like, Looking at, at data and analyzing it and realizing things about communities and cultures and yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, that on one side, like the kind of more like anthropological side, I guess, of economics and stuff. Yeah. But I think in general, like data driven, more kind of objective and value based analysis of society. Yeah. I find very fascinating. Oh, yeah. And that's like one of my weirder Interesting. fascinations, I would so say. So, what a, do, you, do you read? What do you read? Like The Economist or. I actually have never subscribed to The Economist, but I really like The Economist in yeah. general. But I like reading sort of management books on one hand. Like I read mm. uh, Ray Dalio, who's the, um, I forgot the name of his company, but he's like one of the biggest hedge fund managers in the world. Right. And he wrote a book called uh, Life and Work, which is sort of his principles. Um, so it's like on one hand kind of, this sort of management book, a yeah. more sort of corporate level, which doesn't apply to my life at all, yeah. which is great. So I'm always talking to my girlfriend about management. Do you think it's kind of, it's a little <laughs> bit of escapism too, right? Because it's just such a different... But also, I mean, <clears throat> I still harbor kind of like uh, just boss ambitions, you know what I mean? Dream of being a banker on Wall Street. Not a banker necessarily, <laughs> but, you know, I think there's definitely... it's be If you ever end up in a position to manage others, and obviously I do like... A, within the very small microcosm of my project, you know, I do have to act as a leader in terms yeah. of delegating work to other people and kind of keeping the vision on track. Mm. Um, so, you know, things are, things are applicable from that, mm. from that world for sure. Mm. Uh, another crazy book that inspired me a lot in terms of the way that I think about music is uh, by this guy called Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a series of books called Incerdo, and that's more like a philosophical series, but it's all based on his, I mean, his worldview is based on his uh, experience as a trader okay. on, on Wall Street. Right. So the whole, the first one is called Fooled by Randomness, and that kind of like sets off the whole series. Uh, Incerdo means uncertainty in yeah, okay. Latin. And basically the whole principle is just, it's kind of like pulling, the whole principle is basically that much of society is living under the illusion that they're measuring some sort of scientific data when in fact they're actually just observing random noise. So like if, you know, 90% of financial predictions are wrong, for instance, or something like that, you know, or like a, it, a good example would be you put out a record and it does well and you think that it's because of the artwork. And it's right. actually just because it's just actually random. Like Everything's no, just up for interpretation. Yeah. And a lot of shit is just random noise. You yeah. Know, in terms of data. meaninglessness. Yeah, exactly. So that's very that's very Buddhist. Yeah, it is a bit. I guess I never thought about that. Mm. Kind of Zen. Mm. Um, okay, so I want to move on to talking about uh, perspectives. So um, 
issues, challenges, opportunities um, within the music industry itself and, and opinions on stuff that's happening in the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I kind of, there's a few things that I wanted to cover with you. One of, one of them is, uh, I would quite like to have a discussion around diversity in the music industry. It's a hot topic, obviously. Yeah. It's, a, it's an absolutely bloody necessary topic, end of story. Definitely. Um, so I'd quite like to have a chat about that. Um, I also, just, be, just because we had, did have a previous conversation and you were mentioning that you'd quite like to um, talk about standards within the music industry. Yeah. Um, and standards within the electronic music industry. But I think maybe we can talk about that as well as it goes into, as it leans into how the music industry could emerge mm -hmm. from this current COVID crisis. Like, how yeah. are things going to change? Because basically, we're looking at the moment at um, club culture possibly not even re-emerging until 2022. I mean, yeah. you know, in we Germany, I think I'm going to be vaccinated if I'm lucky by November. So, so, and then there's these, it's actually, it's a bit terrifying, isn't it? All the unknowns. So the yeah. music, you know, obviously when it comes to us being artists and writing music, then that's cool. Everything we, is just going ahead as normal. But in mm. terms of opportunities to make money and performance opportunities, and then also like involvement and engagement with fans and just like the general wider human community, because at the moment that's not happening. There is no interface because we can't have live performance. Yeah. Um, and there are no nightclubs. Yeah. Mm. That's, I, I'm starting to get excited about what nightclubs could be like. So yeah. anyway, that's a little bit of a rant. Um, so uh, questions for you. <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot of questions um, there. Yes, there's lots of questions here. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Um, okay, so standards. Opportunities for growth and improvement in terms of skill level and musicianship. Uh, upcoming what do you so I, I don't want to like put you on um, put you into the fire at all but just uh, just like what are your opinions in terms of the electronic music industry mm -hmm. um, that's probably too big and broad an umbrella if we were to talk about the worlds of house and techno and club culture how do you think things have been in the last few years and how do you where do you see things possibly moving post COVID I think over the last few years, things have, I think what I would broadly characterize as underground electronic music. Mm. I mean, that, to me, that's sort of the relevant division. But yeah, to not, be honest- As in like the division is EDM and then everything else. But, that's but kind of I also, I, I take issue with that division even. Yeah. Uh, because the way that I've started to think about mm -hmm. it is more, you know, if I talk to someone like a random person even in Berlin, mm. and I say dance music, mm. they're probably going to say, oh, you mean EDM? Do yeah, you and think? No, they're going to be like banging techno. No, I think, <laughs> I think normal, I, we forget that there's normal, like there's just normal people. Like not normal everyone. Normal people? What there's are people these who normal are like people? A, no, but there's people who listen to, you know, top 40 radio, they might watch. There are? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you, it's, a, it's easy to forget in the, uh, yeah, coming from is. like a sort of underground, mm more underground centric uh, context because it does, you know, like all of my friends, my whole social life is based around connections that I made in a sort of, let's say off, um, it's kind of like an off kilter pop music, like uh, okay. versus, you know, if I had come up socializing in top 40 clubs, then almost surely all of my friends would be into, into top 40 music. Top 40, yeah. yeah okay, so, yeah, there's a bubble. Yeah, okay. yeah. so, so I think there's, there's, I look at it like there's, <laughs> this, there's this movement that's happened. That movement, uh, if we're going to put a historically relevant, like music history name on it, is EDM. Yeah. That's what we're all part of. Yeah. Electronic dance music. Yeah, okay. It's in the title. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. And some that's of it true. is, um, I think before there was a distinction, a big distinction. Uh, and it was kind of there. Well, actually, to start, there was no distinction. It was just, it was just dance music. Like there was a, there was just disco that people happened to be mm. making with drum machines. Yeah, honestly, you know. Yeah, and house music meant everything that you could dance to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, to be honest, it doesn't seem like it was until my lifetime that there even was a relevant division between underground and everything else. Like it was. Yeah. 
electronic music actually wasn't on the radio. Uh, you know, Lady, that's an interesting thing to consider, actually. Yeah, yeah, Lady Gaga was the first artist I remember really coming hard with like electronic beats on U.S. radio, at least. I know it was different in the U.K. and in Europe, mm. but. For us, Lady Gaga was kind of the first big act with four to the, f you know, four to the floor like mm. uh, synth-driven music. Well, there's that I Madonna bet. album. Yeah, that as well. And there was some even Cher, yeah. like Do You Believe or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like at that point, which was sort of around when I started getting into uh, electronic music, it was. It was kind of all, it just felt like one thing. It was, um, there was sort of Electro House, like Justice and mm. Crookers, and those are the people who got- French Electro, yeah. yeah. French Electro is how I got into it. And then I got more into kind of like this, what is now become underground for whatever reason. Mm. And yeah, you know, I really bought into the underground, overground mm. division yeah, for me too. a while. Because it's, it's satisfying. Yeah. Like it's satisfying to feel like you're part of something that is somehow elevated mm. uh, with some sort of whatever justification you have. Maybe you say, oh, the people at that yeah. party all have, mm. you know, fake tits and big muscles or something. Yeah. So I'm, I'm at the party with all the people who are like, who look a little bit more tired, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's why this is better. Or, you know, all those people use VSTs and all these people use analog stuff or all those people play with track yeah. and all these people play with these, vinyl. It's tribalism. Exactly. And yeah. to be honest, you know, I really had a big transition out of that. Uh, and when I stopped seeing things that way, I personally came to the conclusion to finally answer your question. I'm so sorry for this long okay. <laughs> preamble. Right. It's good. Um, but it's good. I really came it. to the conclusion that like, uh, you know, the underground electronic music thing, it's a lifestyle. That's, that's all it is, really. I mean, in terms of musical credibility, musical quality, it's a lifestyle. That, that's it. There's no, there's nothing fundamentally better about a 132 BPM Berghain Techno and Avicii. It's just, if you like Avicii, you like Avicii. Mm. Uh, I mean, what I can say is different about them is that Avicii, even in his short life, and by the way, I'm not like a big Avicii fan, it's mm. just an example, but even in his short life, he's in the like League of Legends or whatever. Mm. I mean, say what yep. you want about his hits, but his yep. hits are so big that he will be remembered yeah, absolutely. indefinitely. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I just, when I kind of pulled the veil back for myself and got past this kind of tribalist sort of thinking about mm. music and dance music in particular, I just realized that the, it, 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 to me, it's just the same thing with varying degrees of success. And one is kind of like a micro economy that has some pretty well paid people and a solid base of uh, supportive fans, but not as big as kind of like, of course, the biggest electronic music in the world. Mm. Um, and that's how that one functions. And the other one functions uh, on the radio. Mm. Uh, but in terms of it, like I think the implications of that in, in terms of quality are just that people are as good as their records are good. You know, I mean, I, I know some people who don't play much in terms of touring who produce incredible music. Mm. Uh, music that I think could be discovered by the next generation looking back at this movement as real sort of, uh, you know, standout tracks. Yeah. Uh, and then there's people who are playing all over the place, making the most money from touring who really have, or even in terms of streaming or something, are actually have a very conservative uh, listening audience compared to what you would expect for how many people they're DJing for. Mm. And it's just because they don't, they don't work on their music. Mm. <laughs> so like people, uh, people respond accordingly. So you know, I think that um, music is as good as the, the process that went into it. It's as good as the discipline from the individual artist who put in the time. I think that the underground in particular has a problem because it exists in a guise of superiority, which is just snobbery, honestly. Mm. And a lot and of it's very empty. 
Yeah. And snobbery is the worst quality that yeah. you can have as a creator, in that, my opinion. Actually, that is so true. This is one thing about the electronic music scene that absolutely does really genuinely irritate me and make me feel quite sad is the, um, is, yeah, is arrogance that you find in certain pockets of it. You yeah. shouldn't feel arrogant about selling 500 records. Right? I, it's like, opinion. you're not Quincy <laughs> Jones. Like, yeah. yeah, There's no I know. sort of like a, yeah, I mean, the best dance music <laughs> no. ever was made by Quincy Jones, I know. in my opinion. It's it's just, uh, no, it, but that's such a human thing. I mean, you could also say that arrogance is just one of the worst things about human beings, full stop, um, and kind of protectionism and defensiveness and, and tribalism and but, fuck everybody else. I mean, it's just like, it's all part of the same thing, really. But I think artists should be better. Yeah, I think that, uh, you're a musician. And I think if you're a, I think the artists, honestly, who I, you know, so the, here's the snobbish perspective. The snobbish perspective from a kind of underground perspective is like, oh, these people are su more successful than me. And it must be because they're worse than me. I mean, what? <laughs> like, oh, this oh, music the tall is, poppy syndrome. Yeah, this, yeah. Music, this music is more popular than mine. Yeah. So... It must be that it's yeah. That's because it's worse than mine. Yeah, that's it? just an awful quirk of humanity where <laughs> you feel you, you want to make yourself feel better by putting other people down. I mean, it's just yeah, it's just not. It's like but the beautiful yeah. thing is it doesn't. And I don't say any of this with bitterness. It's just an observation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and on the flip side, the the beautiful aspect of the the pecking order is that you often find the people who are the most successful they don't feel that way about the people who are less successful. Than them, you know yeah. what I mean? It is kind of like yeah. uh, unique to these sort of um, counterculture sort of uh, that movements. That is know? so true, actually. Um, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a truism, and it's, a, it's also a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a trope, I guess, um, of really successful people who are just not arrogant at all. Yeah, it's but, nice. Yeah, because they're also because they're rich, but yeah, <laughs> like Qu like Quincy Jones. I just Quincy Jones is my is my golden shining artist of all time. I follow him on Instagram. He's lovely. And if so you play lovely. if you play um, off the wall in Panorama Bar, it'll go off more than any sort of oh, shit, underground yeah. record. Well, because it's it's so, I mean it's just great music. If we played it here on a phone, we would be like. Yeah, this is, this oh, is everyone still loves hot. It. Everyone you know? loves it. Yeah, yeah it just uh, that's yep. that's really the that's artistic accomplishment, and I think that that's a universal that's a universal bar in mm. my worldview, at least. Yeah, and you can come from any sort of culture, counterculture, area, whatever. It's an infinitesimally small chance that you'll ever hit a hit like that, but. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it is just like, it, sometimes I think it's better to just judge things more straight up on a business sense because it's just more objective. I mean, it's just like, mm. yeah, okay, cool. You can romanticize all you mm. want, not streaming, for mm. instance. You can romanticize your career in terms of, oh, well, I, you know, I don't have any success on the most relevant music listening platforms in the world. I don't even have my music there, and it's only on vinyl. Uh, and this is because I'm better. Yeah, you know I, mean? I can't stand that attitude. Yeah, it's, not... it's, ri it's so ridiculous. So I'm excited to see the rug pulled out from all of it. Because honestly, I'm not worried about talented people because they're going to find a way to uh, do the yeah. trip. So that's also my perspective on just this co post-COVID world full stop. So it's like there are all these clubs closing in Berlin at the moment. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, a lot of people are, I mean, it is, it's, it's awful. But yeah, it at the same time, this entrepreneurial spirit will, it's not going to go away. You can't, we're not, you know, we're not removing entrepreneurial spirit from people. And the electronic music scene is full of entrepreneurial spirit. There will be people sure. who come through and just make new things happen. Yeah. It don't, it just, it's new opportunities. It's sad, but it's new opportunities as well. Yeah, and I think for creative people, <laughs> it's the biggest opportunity of your life so far. I mean, this is like our war or whatever. You know, whenever you hear about um, these catastrophic historical events happening, followed by a change of pace, a change of fortunes, a change of everything. Yeah. This is, uh, this is like the time we're living in. It's a high volatility, high turnaround, new... Yeah. It's new for everyone, no matter how experienced you are, how many times around the block you've been, you've never been through this. And that's, that's cool. Yeah, it's not all bad, that's for sure. Okay, yeah. hey, so let's talk about diversity in the music industry. Oh, um, nice pivot. 
So, <laughs> trying to trying to work our way there. I could, I don't actually. You know what? I didn't actually really write any questions out here. I just wrote things that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, you are um, you're an artist of color. I'm a woman. We are personally we're interested in this stuff, right? Um, yeah, I don't have a question for you. What should we? How should we approach this? I'm gonna start talking, and you can see if I say anything too offensive. <laughs> Do I, so I, I see that, I mean, I really think things are changing at the moment, which is really cool to see. With my students this week, we watched, a, we watched this GIF, which mm -hmm. is like a, the biggest pop songs in the last, like from 1960 until 2019. Yeah. And so when we were, as we were watching this this week with this class, I was just sitting there thinking, man, this is a bunch of, so I really don't mean to be offensive to anyone, but this is a bunch of like white dudes like mm -hmm. just like dominating the charts like yeah. really like and pop we're talking about pop music but dominating mm -hmm. the charts until like 2010 or something when someone like Wiz Khalifa shows up it's yeah. just like it's crazy like that's the mainstream music industry mm -hmm. but the issues obviously that we're facing in the electronic music industry are similar so so you know we talked about this before but there was a really interesting article that was written by an artist called Roche um, that was that was criticizing resident advisor mm -hmm. about um about their not covering black music scenes and working class music scenes in london um just completely overlooking entire scenes with thousands and thousands of people at these gigs yeah. and so this is one of the issues that the music industry faces is like these kind of these these what like what gets coverage in the press what gets attention um and like who makes these decisions around this sort of stuff. And mm. I, things are going to change. I mean, this article, what I wrote it down here. If anyone is interested, you can Google this. Uh, it's Roshan, I don't know how you say his name, Ch Chow Han. And if you Google measured the scale of ignorance, he basically takes academic social science research skills mm -hmm. to what got covered in the UK music press over yeah. a certain period of years and what didn't compared to gigs and um, popularity of gigs. And it was very much a focus on white dudes. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't mean to, I don't want to criticize, but I just, it's obviously not an, it's not an, it's not an open, balanced playing field and it's it's boring it needs to change yeah well i mean we have to i think we have to be measured in our understand like we have our understanding of history has to counterbalance our sort of natural response to present times and i, yeah. I think a lot of times you know it's it's really easy, for instance, you know, this GIF that you described. Mm. It's easy to look at that and say, it's like, okay, it's like looking at the presidents of the United States. Mm. Yes, every president until Obama was white. Mm. But Obama was black and that's fucking awesome. I mean, mm. I mean that's, a, that's mm. a great story as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And honestly, my yeah, yeah, yeah. disposition <clears throat> is always going to be in that direction, you know? Uh, so that's just... They, let's, op let's, tr let's open up and just work towards a more equitable, it's happening. honest, authentic world. Yeah. Honestly, our, our parents did the work. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that there's uh, not work for, you know, the current generation to, to refine or to, um, mm. to contribute. We have to keep but pushing, like, yeah. You know, my parents... My, I, I'm a, the product of a mixed race couple mm. from the South. Yeah, amazing. That's yeah. because of black music. Yeah, it's working. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's so that's my starting. <laughs> yeah. For, just from a foundational perspective, that's that's where I'm starting. You know, like because out of respect for the people who came before me, I can't be pessimistic. Because I haven't been through what my grandma went through. I haven't been through what my dad went through. Mm. I haven't been through what any of my family went through in that way. Mm. Um, and on the same tip, I haven't been through what my Jewish grandfather on my mom's side went through. Right. Uh, the world is changing. And yep. in my opinion, it's getting better. Mm. Uh, and 
I think it's like a responsibility, especially for people who have any level of influence, to let people know it's getting better. Yeah. Uh, you know, now I've also been vocal when I think people are chatting shit in public, you know, like when people are taking a narrative and just com using, using a narrative to communicate bad or low value ideas. Um, but that's specific, you know what I mean? <laughs> like uh, the, the overall feeling. I mean, I think if, if I can live in Berlin as a black Jew, mm. uh, you know, making music that people from all over the world enjoy and listen to, uh, then whatever the project is of diversity is working. You know, if we're having a conversation uh, with you as a female electronic music artist and, you know, this whole, uh, my mentees and all, all of this, you know, I'm sure the Catalyst program, I mean, it's just a, it's a melting pot of uh, cultures from all over the world, including yeah. white dudes. Yeah, great. yeah, you no, know? absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> like, uh, it's just about, so it's, it's about, it's about shifting the norm, really. Exactly, and yeah. it, but it's, I think that we can't over, estimate our significance in that process yeah because it's it's the tide of history you know what i mean so even this thing about music that you described i can appreciate the poignance of that gif you know but i know for sure that if you start looking at the top 10 records for all of those years Maybe it's not until 2010, let's say even, that there's a number one from a black artist. Well, Michael Jackson. Oh, but I mean, yeah, come on. Like, Michael Jackson, like, he won that shit for, for black people forever, frankly. Biggest, isn't it like Thriller was the biggest selling album of all yeah, time? And stuff. still. Yeah. Which I mean, is like, whoa, yeah, dude. Yeah, so I mean, that's another thing. Quincy like, Jones. How can I... I, I don't want to overvalue electronic music, like black people are the most successful musicians in the world right now. So like, that's, that's great. Why do you think that is? I think that's because, first of all, hip hop is the most popular music in the world right now. Yeah. Um, and that's connected because I think hip hop is the most, it's actually the blackest style of music and like it's it's maintained and operated by black gatekeepers. Yeah. So there is. It's kind of like um, I hate the term cultural appropriation, but I'll use it in this context. Uh, the hip hop is only appropriated culturally in its consumption. Like the only thing that the you know the the only point at which the culture is being disseminated. Uh, like, the, the moment it leaves the culture is for consumption. And yeah. then it's for everyone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it hasn't lost what people love about black music mm. in general. Which, if we're being honest, is saying shit that you can't say in normal situations. Mm. Doing things that you can't maybe do in normal situations, hearing about experiences uh, from people who come from an entirely different world than you do and who maybe you would sort of like even be a bit afraid of if you saw them in a uh, dark alley, even if you wouldn't admit it, not you, but you know, the proverbial you. Mm. Uh, and hearing the experiences of that, hearing just these profoundly human experiences mm coming from this so often it's an dehumanized it's an authenticity. group of people. And it's so beautiful, mm. you know what I mean? And that, mm. that's why I really don't... Look, like I said my piece on the whole sort of like dance music, Black Lives Matter thing mm. with this Resident Advisor video I made, where I was basically criticizing... Did you? Ah, yeah. I didn't know that. So the, like my oh. basic point there, for yeah. example, and I'm just saying this to set the record straight, was just... Stop talking about like um, 
stylistic changes, which basically just make you look less racist and start making black people more money. Yeah. If you want, like that's Completely. it. Like yeah. stop talking about kind of like uh, yeah. anything but like who's getting the bread, basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's my thought process. Yeah. And, but still, I mean, I'm never coming at this from a perspective of pessimism because it is so fucking cool that Pharrell or Kanye or Jay-Z or these dudes, like these are the, some of the most powerful Beyonce. people in inter Beyonce as well. Like these are some of the most powerful people in the entertainment business. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Jay-Z owns a fucking basketball team. Yeah. Progress is yeah. happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, it doesn't um, always happen in a straight line. It was Obama who said that. It doesn't always happen in a straight line, but to be honest, uh, with like a, if you can zoom out with like even a sort of slight statistical perspective, it's, a bit it's like absolutely that. happening yeah. in a straight line. Yeah. I'm sorry, like yeah. uh, it's, yeah. you know, my my dad's mm -hmm. life was easier than his dad's life, yeah. which was certainly easier than his dad's life. Yeah, and my life, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not living with <clears throat> some sort of uh, I'm not living with a consciousness of negativity. Or yeah. negative yeah. Uh, resonance from whatever other people might think of me. And honestly, yeah. I'm not encountering people who think less of me yeah. because I'm black. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I mean, they might think less of me because I talk too much or because I, you know, they don't like <laughs> my too. music <laughs> or a variety of other reasons. But, like, it's, it's great. I mean, I, 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 I have to kind of go based on my perspective. And for me as a black man, I love my life. I love sort of uh, working in the music industry. I think there's a, I think there's more people in general making a living as artists than ever before. Even though it's harder to make money from your music, weirdly. If you ever thought it was gonna be easy to make money from music, you shouldn't be in the business. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's it. <laughs> that's like a good it point. just, yeah. you, you're not crazy enough to be in the business if you thought it was going to be easy to make money. Like, honestly. Uh, the, and that, even putting the diversity part in, in context there, the, the beautiful thing about music is that a good example, like Billie Holiday, mm. whatever it means to win in music, she won. Now, her life was extremely tragic. Mm, really? Uh, and her life was extremely tragic uh, on a personal level because of the time she was living in and the person she was mm. as, a, as a woman of color. You know, mm. uh, she was in essentially the worst societal circumstance that one could be in in probably the entire Western world at that time. Uh, and the music that she created was undeniable. It was just undeniable. It didn't mm. matter, like, no matter what she was going through, mm. and no matter who she was, the music that she was making could not be denied. Head magic. It, yeah. And that is, that's, to me, that's activism for music, you know? Mm. It's just, just the act of doing it and doing it to that level Mm. Or whatever level. That's what you keep saying. Yeah, process, process, do the work, process, do music. the work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my, um, yeah. and I, I think in terms of like active steps that the industry should take, I think, uh, yeah, I think putting more people of different walks of life on track to taking a shot at this, even if it's just for the sake of being more informed fans, is a great thing to do. But that's it. I mean, like uh, the beautiful thing about the business as well, a hit is a hit. Mm. If you have one, you'll know. Mm. And yeah. it doesn't matter who you are, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Like it's just, uh, and I think that's, I think there's a lot of, for whatever remaining liberation there is, uh, or for whatever liberation is, remains needed for certain marginalized groups, I think that aspect of music has a lot more potency than a protest song, for instance. 
Like, I, I think that, and I think people... Connecting with people on a heart level. Also just breaking, to show that something great can be created from circumstances that are far from ideal. Yeah, okay, and even the redeemingness of it. It's, that is, that's it to me, you know? And I mean, I think that's, that's it for everyone. That's actually a universal thing. I mean, you could look at the Beatles, the whitest dudes on earth, and still that redemption is there. Like just a bunch of lads from Liverpool. Yeah, they're amazing. There's no reason, they're, they're not the Beatles because they're white, they're the Beatles because they're fucking geniuses. Yeah. And I think that there's, I'm always balancing those two things yeah. in this conversation. And I have to be honest, I think people often sell out music in pursuit of a cheaper and simpler version of this conversation. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I think the conversations that we're having, though, are really important. So I'm just going to say that because I keep thinking this. I think that, so I always say this to my students as well. I feel mm. like, so you can feel like, oh, God, like, can we stop talking about this stuff? You know, mm. I've, I have had students say that to me. Yeah. But it's like, we have to continue having these conversations because we actually, we need to, we need to work it out together. And it needs to stay, it needs to stay in people's um, in their in their minds, because over time, there's there are conflicts in the heart of it. But over time, mm -hmm. we make friends with those conflicts be, when you consider them, when you think about them. If you avoid them, then we're not going to get anywhere with it. So I think these conversations yeah. are important. So and that's why I bring the it up. Paradoxes that are kind of like, a, and I think this is the thing. You know, for artists, should be navigating. Complexity, in my opinion. Yeah. Philosophically, creatively, on every, on you know, I think great art comes from these sort of central tensions. And when I say that the music is being sold out in pursuit of a cheap version of thinking about these kind of social justice things, what I mean by that is, I think there's a lot of people who would rather remove the nuance from music altogether for the sake of a one-dimensional answer about these questions than they would to embrace the complexity, which maybe they don't have a good grasp of, actually. Because what I notice is that I think black people are experts at this complexity. And I think it's a big part of why black music is what it is. Um, and to be honest, I think all great artists are experts at this complexity. Um, even the ones who have opinions that you think are terrible. You know, I think Richard Wagner had a really good sense of complexity and contradiction, ambiguity, nuance. Uh, he was a terrible man. You know, yeah, <laughs> on, all, on all fronts. I don't. I can't but, listen to Wagner. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think. Um, it's really, really important to put music first, put art first, put like the fundamental, like the answer has to be the work. And I think very often the answer is supplementing or replacing trash work in a lot of cases. I think a lot of people are, uh, putting out like a really sort of woke press release with a really bad EP. And I don't think yeah. that they're doing it so uh, So you're talking about people kind of ex almost exploiting the the what? the Black Lives Matter or the or the kind of the racial card or Well, I wouldn't even go that far with it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll make it a bit broader just for the sake of not cuz I don't feel that intensely as that no. as that sounds. But what I'm saying is just like if you're not making great records, yeah, I don't fucking care what you think about music. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's my yeah. Like, uh, and I will always care more. Yeah. As okay. a fan and as an artist. Okay. About someone <laughs> who is doing something, even so someone saying nothing, and making great art. To me, is always going to 
is always going to win the day. Yeah. I'm always going to be looking there for answers. Yeah. Even if yeah. I totally okay. disagree with yeah. what they think. Because even if the way someone who is capable of handling that complexity to me, the way that they're going to be able to think even an opinion that I totally disagree with is going to teach me so much more than someone who's one dimensional in both their creativity and in their thought. Yeah. Um, so I put the process at the top of the hierarchy of importance. Yeah. Or the bottom of the pyramid. It's the foundation. Mm. I'm not sure. If you pick. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's quite. <laughs> it's quite intense. deep and nuanced <laughs> what you're talking about. I'm gonna have to go back and, and listen to re-listen to some of this. So there's a, there's a few moments where I'm like, what do you what do you mean there? And I have opinions about it as well. Um, and it does get complex. Yeah. And it's easy to offend people as well. But it's fun. Yeah. I mean, if you're not comfortable offending people, then like, <laughs> it's like. Yeah, I, it, I kind of, I, I don't, like, I'm, I'm all for these discussions and I don't want to, I don't like it when people are um, too easily offended. Yeah, I just, like, it's like, we need to remain open to the conversation. Has that context Canc this ever whole, produced? Like, c cancel culture, for example, to me is, is just a bit outrageous. Yeah. I find it, uh, I, it's, it's, it's ironic, it's kind of wrong. And it's rampant in yeah. the so-called underground. And it makes it worse, yes, honestly. But it's almost because things become kind of trendy and two-dimensional and then we, lo we lose the complexity, yeah. Exactly, and what else are artists here to do uh, but navigate that complexity? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely, yep. Hey, so um, I'm getting a, <laughs> a wrap it up um, <laughs> sign from Hannah over here. Um, I actually, you know, I don't have the time on me. So I, um, so yeah. So I, six hours. Do we have time for questions? Are we done? We're done. Sorry? Okay. Okay, excellent. So we're, we're done. Okay, cool. Great. This has been a really good conversation. I've yeah, really, really fun. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Likewise. Brilliant. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you so so much for coming and talking to us. Yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss some interesting stuff. It's yeah. Been super fun for me. Yeah. Cool. Definitely a, a welcome break from my uh, apartment life. Your small apartment <laughs> life. I know. In, in your slippers. Um, so tell me, what are your plans in the next, like, how, like, what is the next six months to a year looking like for you? Obviously COVID dependent. Just dropping, just dropping a lot of music, honestly. Writing lots of music, yeah. But writing and releasing a lot of music. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of moving towards a more independent model of releasing my work uh, and one that's much more applicable to the rate at which I'm creating stuff. So using Bandcamp, are you talking about? Bandcamp. Love and Bandcamp, the, by the, the way. Bandcamp, whoop, whoop. Yeah, all of the DSPs, you know? Like, yeah. I, I use Spotify all, all day, every day, so. Yeah, so do I, but I, I sometimes question the moral, uh, the moral um, implications of that, just anyway. That's a whole and, other conversation. Yeah, we'll Let's not two. go down it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that in part two. Yeah. But yeah, so just, um, just focused on writing, uh, sharing that process with everyone through my videos uh, and releasing the music that's in the works, you know, just as soon as it's done. And the COVID song. That's coming out, for example. Mm. So that, that, um, that's really, I think, the new way, at least for me, to share stuff with the world. I, I mean, it's so, it's so fun to even for, even for an idea of mine what would have just been an idea before, and maybe you would never have heard it unless we were sitting in the studio together playing music for each other or something. But it's so cool that you even know what that track is. Yep. And it, it makes it so much more fun to, and so much more exciting to then release something like that, you know? Yep. So I think that's really a, kind of going to set the tone for the process of releasing music that I'm setting up, and I'm excited to just focus on that. Cool. Nothing's more fun, so. Great. Awesome. That's Look the forward plan. to it. Great. <laughs> Okay, I think we're done. I think so. Thanks for thanks for uh, listening, and uh, I hope you got something out of this, you guys. Yeah. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.